Well, tonight we're going to be blessed because we're going to cover an entire chapter of the Gospel of John. Um, and I was mentioning to those that joined later uh, that uh, this is the 25th lesson that we've had in the book of John. And we're getting close to, well, sort of close to halfway through. There's a lot of information in this book. We're going to look at chapter 9 of John's gospel. And this is the chapter where Jesus miraculously heals or gives sight to a man that was born blind. A lot of times you get the feeling that Jesus restored the sight to this man, but this man was born blind. He never had sight in the first place. And we're going to talk about how Jesus gave sight to this man that was born blind. Um, we, yeah, I didn't we're going to look at the 42 verses in chapter 9, and we'll focus on a key verse that's from Isaiah chapter 42, 7. As a review of the lessons that we've had over the past few weeks, we worked our way through chapter 8 of John's gospel, focusing on Jesus's teachings at the temple during the Feast of the Tabernacle. And this is where Jesus in the very first part of chapter eight, revealed himself as the Messiah that God promised to send to Israel. And he um, identified himself as the Messiah by referring to two parts of the Old Testament. One where he said that he was the Messiah that would quench the thirst for those that were seeking spiritual life, giving them streams of living water. And then he also revealed that he was the Messiah who was sent as the light of the world to illuminate and dispel the darkness of man's sin and man's rejection of the truth and to bring eternal life into the world. And then we analyzed Jesus' statement that as the son of God, who God sent to bring salvation, he is the truth that sets us free from the bondage of sin. After the Feast of the Tabernacles, we then focused on Jesus' dialogue with the Jews. And in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, when he refers to the Jews, he's referring to the religious leaders of the Jews. And his dialogue, uh, these religious leaders were deceiving themselves about their own righteousness as descendants of Abraham. And they rejected Jesus' claims about being the Son of God who had been sent to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. If you remember, we Jesus accused these religious leaders of being children of the devil, who is their true spiritual father. He also told the religious leaders that only those who accepted him as the son sent by God, the father, and those who obey his commands will never see death. And at this, these Jewish leaders just went off their handle. Um, because they didn't believe that Jesus could save anybody from life. And he said, they basically said, all the prophets died, and you're saying that you give us eternal life and that we'll never suffer death. So Jesus concluded his dialogue with the religious leaders telling them that he is indeed God. If you remember, he told them, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. I am being that reference that God made to Moses in when Moses asked God to identify himself so that he could tell the Israelites that he was supposed to lead out of the promised land, out of Egypt to the promised land. He could tell the Israelites who God was. And God says, I am. We concluded our study in chapter eight, learning that the religious leaders became so enraged at hearing Jesus' claim to be God that they attempted to stone him to death and how Jesus slipped away from being stoned by them. This week, we're going to learn that Jesus, as he was leaving the temple, uh, on the, just on the cusp of being stoned, um, he encountered a man who had been blind since birth. And Jesus paused and miraculously healed this man's blindness. We'll learn that the miraculous healing of the man's blindness was a miracle never performed in the Old Testament and was performed by Jesus as a Messiah. We'll also learn how the physical healing of the blind man's sight 
and his bold testimony about what Jesus had done for him led the way for this man to receive the spiritual sight of salvation when Jesus revealed to him who he actually was. We will also focus on the religious leaders' inquiry regarding the miracle and how their ignorance and unbelief reinforced their spiritual blindness leading to their spiritual death. The main message that I want you to get from tonight's lesson, healing the blind was one miracle which was never performed in the Old Testament and was reserved to identify Jesus as the Messiah. Knowing this, Jesus used the physical healing of the man who had been born blind to separate those who by their belief would receive spiritual enlightenment, sight, and salvation from those who refused to believe and would remain in spiritual darkness or blindness and death. And so this is a very good chapter that contrasts sight and blindness with spiritual light and spiritual death. And we're going to uh, focus on these, these two aspects that are contained in chapter nine. So our study is gonna be Jesus healing of the man who had been born blind, displayed the work of salvation during Jesus' life and exposed the spiritual blindness of the religious leaders who were predispositioned or predisposed to discredit Jesus and what Jesus had done. We're going to break this down into four parts. Jesus' healing of the man who had been born blind, the steadfast and bold testimony of the man who had been miraculously healed from his blindness, the ignorance and unbelief of the religious leaders who are predisposed to discredit the miracle and discredit Jesus, and then finally, how the miraculous healing of the blind man's sight led to his receiving spiritual sight and salvation, and at the same time, led to the spiritual blindness and death of those who refused to believe. And then we'll get into our discussion with discussion questions. So let's get into the study itself. Jesus' healing of the man who had been born blind, displayed the work of salvation during Jesus' life, and exposed the spiritual blindness of the religious leaders who were predisposed to discredit Jesus and what Jesus had done. We're going to start with Jesus' healing of the man who had been born blind. Now, as I mentioned, this is tied into chapter 8 at the end because the religious leaders became so enraged at Jesus' claim that he was God before Abraham, I am, that they picked up rocks to try and stone Jesus, and Jesus slipped out of their gasp, uh, grasp. As he was leaving the temple to avoid being stoned by the religious leaders, Jesus stopped to heal a man who had been blind from birth. In chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, the scriptures read, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said that, he spit on the ground, made some mud with sal his saliva, and put it in the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. So that is the miracle that Jesus performed to give this man who had never seen the light of day, who is completely in darkness until this moment, Jesus gave him sight. Now, it was a common belief among the Jewish people at the time that any physical deformities that were suffered by a man or hardships which people suffered in their life was a result of sin. It almost goes back to what we learned in the book of Job about how everybody thought that the maladies that come upon human beings is because of some sin of that person or that person's family. We forget that all a man is plagued by sin and maladies exist in our world because of the broken uh, world because of mankind's sin. But Jesus' response to his disciples' question about the cause of the man's blindness 
was not necessarily directed at God causing or allowing this man to be blind from birth. Jesus was actually telling his disciples that he was about to demonstrate his glory as a Messiah by healing his blindness and bringing him into salvation. So Jesus responded, it's neither the, this man nor the parent's sin, but he didn't explain the cause of this man's blindness. But what he did say is basically, this is an opportunity that is given to me to show that I'm the Messiah and I'm going to be able, I'm going to give this man sight and I'm going to give him spiritual salvation. And so it, this response was more directed to what Jesus was about to do to demonstrate his authority, power, mercy, and glory, and was not directed to answer the question about the reason why God allowed the man to be born blind in the first place. Jesus' miraculous healing of the blind man's sight was not complete until the man received the spiritual sight of, of salvation. Now, when Jesus mentioned his work during the daylight, he's really work talking about his own life on earth and his ministry on earth. This is the work that he performed um, during his earthly ministry to all that were spiritually blind. And so he says, basically, he's telling his disciples, we're running out of time. I, we need to do the work that I was called to do by the Father. And when he talked about running out of time, he, we're talking about a period of time within five months of his going to the cross and dying on the cross and then being resurrected. Now, Jesus as the Messiah and as the Son of God was the first prophet to ever perform the miracle of giving sight to those that were physically blind. I thought this is an interesting point. There is no, there are a lot of miracles in the Old Testament, the resurrection of people from the dead, the all different type of things, the lifting of the anvil from the water, um, all these miraculous signs, but not once in the Old Testament did any prophet ever give sight to a person that was born blind. The ability to give sight to the blind was exclusively reserved to identify Jesus as a Messiah. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet writing about the Messiah said in Isaiah 42, verses 6 and 7, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. We've already studied that part. But the very next verse, and to open the eyes that are blind. And so in chapter 42 of the book of Isaiah, God is revealing to the prophet Isaiah the coming of the Messiah. And one signature sign that whoever came was the Messiah is to open the eyes that are blind. And here we are in the New Testament where Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy, identifying or signaturing himself as a Messiah. Recall that when John the Baptist was in Herod's prison cell, and sent messengers to ask Jesus if Jesus was truly the Messiah. Jesus affirmed that he was indeed the Messiah by telling uh, the messengers that John the Baptist sent to go back and tell John that the blind were receiving sight as foretold in the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 5, when John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. So the telltale sign, one of the telltale signs prophesied in the Old Testament about the Messiah was that he would give sight to the blind. Even the man who had been born blind and was healed by Jesus later on, as we're going to study, told the Pharisees that the Old Testament scriptures affirmed that only the Messiah would have the power to give sight to the blind. In verse 30 of this same chapter we're studying, this man that had had his sight given to him by Jesus, the man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. 
Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So those are three corroborations, if you will, that this miracle that was performed by Jesus to give sight to this man that was born blind was a signature sign that he, Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Now we're going to talk about this bold and steadfast testimony of the man who had been miraculously healed from his blindness. After he received his sight, the man who had been blind from birth returned to his home where he met with his neighbors and by implication by what occurs in the rest of the chapter and his parents. Jesus told him after he put the mud on the man's eyes, he told him to go and wash himself in the pool. And after he did, and he saw things for the first time, he went home in Jerusalem. He went home to his family. He didn't go back to Jesus. So in verse seven, the scriptures say, so the man went and washed and came home seeing. And so it's almost natural that, you know, the parents who have had a son that was born without sight, without being able to see, that when he had sight, he returned home to his parents, probably in joy and in astonishment and in marveling about seeing the world for the first time. He meets his neighbors. And at first, the neighbors were unsure if he was the same man they knew had been born blind. The man testified to his neighbors that he was the same man who had been born blind. You can imagine that the neighbor saying, well, he looks the same, but he can see. Is this really the one that was blind? Or is he a twin brother? Is, is it the other Daryl, so to speak? Anyway, in John chapter 9, verses 8 and 9, the scriptures read, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. I am the man that was begging, and now I can see. And so, still skeptical, the neighbors asked the man how he had been healed by, of his blindness. In verses 10 and 12, scriptures say, how then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said, because he, he didn't go back to Jesus. He went home. And anyway, this is an important part of this tonight's lesson is because we're going to hear about the edict that the religious leaders passed that anybody that had anything to do with Jesus or claimed to be a disciple of Jesus, they were literally going to be excommunicated from the Jewish community and kicked out of the synagogue. And so there's a fear of the people in Jerusalem about this edict, because when they heard him mention that Jesus had healed him, now they were concerned, what are we supposed to do? Well, they say, we better send this man to the religious leaders, because we don't want to be tied in and connected in any way to Jesus, because we don't want to lose our privileges and rights as Jewish people in the synagogue. So when the man told his neighbors that a man named Jesus had healed his blindness, the neighbors, acting out of fear and disbelief, decided to take him to the religious leaders to investigate the claims made by the man who had been blind from birth. Verse 13 says, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. You can see that the religious leaders had control over the religious community. So now we're going to get to the next phase of this lesson is, is that this man had encountered the neighbors and perhaps his parents. The neighbors decided out of caution to take him to the religious leaders. And now he's before the religious leaders in the temple. And we're going to look at focus on the ignorance, a key word, and unbelief of the religious leaders who are predisposed to discredit the miracle and Jesus. So as this unfolds, we're going to see how unbelief and ignorance on the part of the religious leaders showed they were predisposed to discredit Jesus and find fault with the, either the miracle or what Jesus had done. 
learning that the man had been healed by Jesus on the Sabbath, the religious leaders sought to discredit Jesus by asking the man, how had he had been healed? Instead of rejoicing that a man that was blind from birth, that was always around the temple begging, that his sight had been given to him, they're asking, okay, if you were healed by Jesus, how did he do it? Because they knew that this had happened on the Sabbath. And so in verses 14 through 15, now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Well, you already know what the Pharisees thought about Jesus working on the Sabbath and violating their man-made rules about working on the Sabbath. And so their question was pointed to discredit Jesus. It was pointed towards, oh, geez, there he goes again. He's working on the Sabbath, violating our laws. And so, again, focusing on their own rules about working on the Sabbath, some of the Pharisees attempted to discredit Jesus as a sinner who disobeyed the commandment of the Sabbath. Verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Well, we know from other scriptures that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath and that the Sabbath, the commandment about honoring the Sabbath as a day of rest never precluded anybody from doing anything good or healing on the Sabbath. But technically, right. under these religious rules, the, the Pharisee said spitting and making mud and putting on an eyes to heal a person from their blindness, that's a work. And that's a work on the Sabbath, and therefore, Jesus is a sinner. See how they're predisposed to discredit Jesus any way they can? Other Pharisees argued about only a man sent by God could perform the miracle of giving sight to the blind. Some of the Pharisees recognized that this, old, this had never happened in the Old Testament. There's no example in the Old Testament where a man was healed from being blind. That seems to indicate that Jesus came from God. The verse says, but others ask, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So what we see now is the man become, comes before these religious leaders and all of a sudden an argument. He's a sinner. Well, if he did these miracles, he can't be a sinner. He has to be from God. And so they're arguing. And surprise of surprise, who do they turn to to ask who, for an opinion? The very man that was blind. So other Pharisees, the, in the midst of their confusion and debate, the religious leaders incredibly asked the man who he thought Jesus was. In verse 17, they say, finally, they turned again to the blind man. What do you have to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. <laughs> so, so all of a sudden, he's a religious theory because he is healed by a miraculous power of Jesus. And the, these religious leaders that are supposed to know everything about the Old Testament. They're asking this guy who was blind who Jesus was. If indeed Jesus had given the blind man sight, the Pharisees were forced to acknowledge that the power to give sight to the blind was a power from God. However, in their unbelief, they refused to accept that Jesus power came from God. Boy, they're really stuck on this thing. They recognize the power coming from God, but they don't recognize the power going to Jesus as God to restore, to give uh, sight to the blind man. Not knowing that Jesus was the Messiah or was God, the man replied simply that Jesus was a prophet. And in uh, the next verse, the scriptures say, the man replied, He's a prophet, very safe bet, because we know that prophets were able to do miraculous things, but they don't have to be God. This man that was blind was not ignorant or stupid, and he wasn't, he didn't lack knowledges about the scripture. In many ways, we're going to see how this man, unsophisticated, not trained, really outdoes, uh, outdoes all the Pharisees that were trying to interrogate him. But the response of the Pharisees, not wanting to accept this answer, the Pharisees now question whether or not the man was blind in the first place and summoned the man's parents to testify about what they knew. At first, they accepted that the man was blind and that his sight was given, given to him. But now, because he answered that this man was a prophet that, that gave him sight, 
they didn't want to accept that. So now they begin to question the man. Maybe this man was lying all the time. He was never blind. So let's get his parents in here and find out if this man was really truly their son and blind. Uh, so in verses 18 to 20, the Jews still did not believe that they, he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. The parents arrive. Is this man your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? The man's parents were willing to confirm that the man was indeed their son and that they knew he was blind from birth. But they're afraid to answer any other questions which would associate them with Jesus. So look how carefully they deal with the Pharisees. We know that he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. They stopped. The religious leaders had to put out an edict that anyone who claimed that they believed Jesus or who were Jesus' disciples would be excommunicated from the synagogue and ostracized from the community. The parents were not willing to take that risk. Verses 21 through 23, the scriptures read, but, now he, but how can he see now? Or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. In other words, we're going to tell you who our, this is our son. We're going to tell you that he's buying from birth, but we're going to stop there because we don't know what you'll do to us if we say that he was healed by Jesus miraculously giving him sight. So they, they don't answer that part of the question. Now the, the, the religious leaders, they're getting frustrated. Their investigation is not going the way they want. Frustrated because they not, had not obtained any information which would discredit Jesus, the Pharisees summoned the man who had been blind from birth to repeat his testimony, hoping to find inconsistencies or information which would discredit the man or his testimony. So they're running out of options. They decide, let's see if we can trap him. Let's bring him back and let's interrogate him some more. And verses 20 through 4 through 27, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know that this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. Why? Do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? <laughs> and so here's this unsophisticated guy, and he's just walking around these religious leaders. And he's basically saying, he, you know, he didn't take the bait, and he didn't change his testimony, and he, ref and he refused to concede or accept that Jesus was a sinner. He simply affirmed that his healing was a miracle which Jesus performed. By asking the Pharisees if they wanted to become disciples of Jesus, the man was really asking the Pharisees, why couldn't they accept the one undeniable fact that his blindness was miraculously healed by what Jesus had done? It's that simple. And the man just made it that simple. Why couldn't they accept that this is a miracle and Jesus performed the miracle? How simple can you make it? But the Pharisees didn't want it simple. They wanted it complex. They wanted to discredit Jesus. They couldn't discredit the man because they knew from his parents that he was born blind. And they knew that it had to be a miracle that this man could see. So they said, give credit to God, but don't give credit to Jesus because he isn't God. He's a sinner. He violates the Sabbath. Refusing to believe that Jesus was sent by God, the Pharisees turned to insulting the man who had been healed and proclaimed their own righteousness as followers of Moses, seeking to separate Jesus from Moses, who they knew was sent by and spoke on behalf of God. So when all else fails and you can't win the argument, insult the person that you're arguing with. Make, call him and make him uh, insults. So they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, 
we don't know. We don't even know where he comes from. So they're basically saying, you know, we're, Jesus has nothing to do with God's promises, has nothing to do with mo what God spoke to Moses. We know that, that we're under Moses, but we don't accept Jesus. We don't even know where Jesus is from. How shoddy of work. They believe that Jesus was from Galilee. Well, even Herod knew that Jesus was in Bethlehem. Herod sent people to kill babies up to two years old in Bethlehem, knowing that he was uh, sent and miraculously born. And yet the religious leaders claim that they don't know where Jesus was from. They didn't do their homework. All they had to do is check. And they'd know that Jesus was not born in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. But again, this is the, this is the problem that you have when you're predisposed to a certain ideology and you want to you you investigate only to find the evidence you're looking for not to find the truth do we see that in our society today you know um i i almost pull out what little hair i have left anytime i think about the january 6th committee because if they want the truth to figure out what to do to protect the capital from people coming in and trespassing and causing damage or uh, terrorizing this, the legislature, why don't they bring in other people that were responsible for protecting the Capitol? Oh, they don't want to call those. Why don't they bring an impartial panel? No, they have a partial panel. They're act what's happening in our society today happens all the time, where people are predisposed to find evidence that support what they already believe instead of looking for the truth. Now, this is interesting because the man whose blindness had been healed by Jesus responded with the same two undeniable facts about his healing that he had told him about earlier. One, that Jesus was the one who miraculously healed him. And two, that only a man sent by and empowered by God could perform such a miracle. Look how bold and steadfast this man is. In verses 30 to 33, the man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. That's a center of mass punch. He is laying it right on the Pharisees' feet. And concerned cornered by what the man told him but still refusing to believe that jesus was who jesus said he was the religious leaders accused the man of being a sinner from birth and reasserted their elevated status and learning after all of this what did the pharisees say to this they replied you were steeped in sin at birth how dare you lecture us and then they threw him out they wanted to have no more investigation, nothing more to do with this witness, because a witness was not telling them what they needed to hear or that they wanted to hear. So now we get done with that part, but Jesus isn't finished with his miracle. We're going to look at how the miraculous healing of the blind man's sight led to his receiving spiritual sight and salvation, and at the same time led to the spiritual blindness and death for those that refused to believe. The adamant and steadfast testimony of the man who had been born blind before the religious leaders prepared the man to take the next step towards believing that Jesus was the Messiah sent by God. All the man needed was for Jesus to reveal himself as the Messiah. So Jesus, knowing this, went to find the man who he healed from blindness to reveal who he was. In verses 35 through 37, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. He's just ripe for harvest. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. So Jesus knew how the man had been treated in the temple, how the Pharisees had tried to trick the man. And they really were forcing this man to make his own question to raise his own question this man is sent from god this man did perform a miracle this man gave me sight who is this man 
and he's kicked out of the temple and Jesus goes to find him. And at this most moment, Jesus reveals that he's the Messiah. He's the promised one. He is the one sent by God. And what's the result? The man believed and worshiped Jesus as his Lord and Savior. His physical blindness was healed, and now his spiritual blindness was healed. In verse 38, then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. The only person that's deserving of worship is God. And this man, what he had been through, first, his sight being given to him. Secondly, his being interrogated and examined by the Pharisees who claimed that Jesus was a sinner, but this man affirmed with what he knew about God that only God could perform miracles or a man sent by God. And it just put him in a position so that when Jesus found him after he had been kicked out of the temple and Jesus revealed that he was the son of God, the Messiah, the man believed. So we really have a bracket of healings in chapter nine. We have the healing of this man's sight. He is born blind, but Jesus gave him sight, physical sight. And then we at the end of the chapter, we have Jesus revealing who he is and this man accepting Jesus as a savior. Two miraculous hearings, healings. So Jesus, this is the postscript to the story, Jesus concluded by telling the man that those who do not know the truth, that is those who are blind, but believe will receive spiritual sight. But those who think that they know the truth, but refuse to believe are spiritually blind and subject to God's judgment and condemnation. Verses 39 through 41, Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who will become blind and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. Sin. But now that you claim you can see, you remain, your guilt remains. Jesus is basically saying, if you think that you know the truth, then you're blind. But if you're blind because you're not exposed to the truth, but the truth is given to you, then you will see. And so the, I, I think the Pharisees that were over here in this conversation got the message that their religiousness, their self-righteousness, their knowledge of the scriptures, that isn't salvation. Salvation are those that believe in the truth, believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Messiah. So... There's a lot of material we covered here, but I think that the reason I covered it all in one lesson um, is because I think it all fits together to the two healings that Jesus gave that are instructive for us today, is that it's in our lives as Christians today, when we receive the truth about who Jesus is, we receive spiritual life. And in the next life, when we have our resurrected bodies, we're going to have the physical healing and perfection that comes from a resurrected body. And so Jesus is re really saying, ultimately, all those that are saved are going to be physically healed and spiritually healed and receive eternal salvation. So now we're going to get visions and applications. In his gospel, the Apostle John seeks to prov provide evidence to prove that Jesus is God so that those who reviewed the evidence would believe and by believing receive eternal life. The Gospel of John reveals how the evidence he presented in his gospel caused many to believe. But at the same time, John reveals how many refused to believe. Jesus' miraculous healing of the man who had been born blind was a signature miracle which identified Jesus as a Messiah sent by God. Testifying before the Pharisees, the man who Jesus had healed repeatedly affirmed that he had been miraculously healed, that Jesus had performed the miracle, that, and that only a man sent by God could perform such a miracle. The Pharisees had already decided that Jesus was not God and that he had not been sent by God. 
they were predisposed to discredit Jesus and everything Jesus did and anyone who claimed otherwise. The inquiry which the Pharisees made about what Jesus had done was not designed to uncover the truth. The inquiry was made only for the purpose of finding a way to discredit Jesus and the man who Jesus had healed, and not to affirm what they already believed in rejecting Jesus as God or as a Messiah. When confronted with the two undeniable truths, that the blind man had been miraculously healed and that Jesus had performed the miracle, the religious leaders refused to believe became angry, insulted the man, and threw him out of the temple. The Pharisees' refusal to believe reflected their spiritual blindness, which condemned them to God's judgment. The steadfast testimony of the blind man as to what Jesus had done prepared him to believe when revealed to him that Jesus was indeed the Messiah and the Son of God. The glory of Jesus was demonstrated by not only the miraculous healing of his ability to see, but also by the even greater miracle of the blind man receiving the spiritual sight of salvation. Okay. <clears throat> 